Hello and good morning. This is the Reverend Christina Hine from Galston Parish Church coming to you live from my home office <laughs> here from the manse. Um, just going to take a few minutes to kill some time as we wait for pe people to join in. So greetings and welcome to you as you come. Um, please do um, say hello and share in the comments and uh, and don't be shy <laughs> about um, uh, saying um, hello to one another as well as um, perhaps giving uh, prayer requests or anything like that. So um, <clears throat> as we begin, I hope none of you were caught out today by the time change. Um, it was sort of like uh, yesterday going, is it or isn't it? Is it is it really happening tomorrow or is it tonight or is it next week? Um, but here we are. Mm -hmm. um, today was the, uh, the, the time change. And so hopefully you didn't come here at 10 o'clock this morning and go, oh, where is everybody? Where's the pastor? So I'm here. It's 11 o'clock. Um, and welcome. And so I'm seeing that uh, folks are coming in. So, oh, including somebody who's up very early or up very late in Buffalo. So <laughs> welcome to you. Um, let's see, as we begin, I hope that you have made your space at home a worshipful space remembering to that we have been lighting a light um to remind um us of god's presence with us wherever we may be worshiping i've got my safe light up here in the corner um so for those of you who are unable to have a candle um something like this mine mine this was actually it's a christmas tree <laughs> But there you go. It's about Jesus, right? Um, so we hope that you have a way of making your space at home a worshipful space. Um, and we use the the light to remember Christ's presence is with us and that life light is a gift from God and a gift to be shared. And Jesus came into our midst as the light of the world. And so in lighting that light, we remember Christ's presence with us. Um, also, as we begin this morning, um, if you have not seen the previous video that I live video that I did for the church, um, that I have, we have announced that we are going to be reopening the church for worship. We've gotten our necessary permissions granted. Um, and so on November 1st, we will um be opening for worship and um same time same place <laughs> 11 o'clock um as per um, the governmental guidelines we are um have uh, strict protocols as we come into the, to the church and so do be aware that um it's going to feel a little different um of course, um, we'll need to wear a mask. There will be um, all the seating is marked out for everyone so that we can all be appropriately, appropriately physically distanced while in the church. Um, there's a, a one-way system in place um, in one door and, and out um, another door, or it'll be down one aisle and out out the other um, for the church, um, as well as uh, for those who uh, need wheelchair accessibility, the usual door from uh, the hog hall side of the church uh, is available for those who need wheelchair access. So um, very exciting news, <laughs> a little bit daunting as well, because I have now been doing worship here from my home for how many months <laughs> now <laughs> I do, uh, a lot um and so uh 
yeah, getting your brain back into um, our worshipful space and, and the needful needfulness of, of our fellowship together. And so um, I hope that you all can be present. Um, we um, are limited to a cap capacity of 50 within the sanctuary, um, as, but we will have overflow spaces available in the hog hall and the service will be uh, continue to be live streamed on Facebook as it has been for the last few months um, so that those who are unable to be physically present with us will st still be able to join in to worship um, as we have been um, since March. So uh, the live streaming on Sunday um, from, on the Facebook page Will continue to happen in the future um, and those who are in end up being in the hog hall um, will be watching on a screen <laughs> that live um, uh, uh, set so yes things are going to be different and, and I think we need to be prepared for that you know there will still there won't be any hymn singing things like that, but we will be able to fellowship with one another, to be able to be present with one another, and I hope that this is a help to those who maybe have been struggling th through the isolation of the last few months. So with that, um, I'm going to move on and we will begin our worship here this morning. So hear now our call to worship. In a world that cries out, fear me, we will listen to Jesus's words, don't be afraid. In a world that wants us to hate the other, we will live Jesus's call to love God, love your neighbor as you love yourself. In a world that radicalizes we too will be radical, radical with our hospitality, radical with our hope, and radical with our love. Then come into this place, ready to be who we are called to be. Let us gather together and worship God. Let us now move into a time of prayer. Eternal God, before whom the book of history is laid and who sees every event, knows every character, experiences every moment, compared to you, we are but a dandelion seed blowing in the wind or a speck of dust caught in the sunlight. For we exist only in a moment, what we call the present, but that is a gift from you. We cannot return to yesterday and cor correct our errors. We cannot venture into tomorrow and discover what lies ahead. Now is all we have. We are a limited people, confined and restricted. And yet from beyond time and all the stars, you reach out to us in love, to embrace us, to enfold us and to make us welcome. And we rejoice and give you thanks for your mercy and your grace. God of mercy, whose heart is full of forgiveness and who does not deal with us as we deserve. When we have thought of ourselves more highly than we ought and forgotten to put our relationship with you first, forgive us, we pray. When we have loved only those who love us or, and ignored or turned aside from those who need a smile and a hand of friendship, forgive us, we pray. When we have acted as if all tomorrow was ours yet neglected to do good in the moment of this day, forgive us, we pray. May Christ Jesus, who healed the sick, gave sight to the blind, and loosened the tongues of the dumb. Free us from our faults, 
and all that would hold us back from being the children that the eternal and loving in God desires. And let us pray now together the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Friends, hear the good news. God meets us in our struggle with words of comfort and hope and transformation. We are forgiven, we are loved, and called to live reforming lives of forgiveness and love. Thanks be to God. Amen. Well, today is a special day in the church calendar and churches across the world today are celebrating what's called Reformation Sunday. Um, and this is um, celebrating the history of the form of the church. When we um, had looked back and seen the direction that the church was going and thought, you know what, we need to go in another direction. And um, one of the instrumental men, <laughs> there were there were several men in, in history who um, called for reform in the church, but the one who is most notably recognized is Martin Luther. And he was a priest in the church in the 1500s. And in 1517, he wrote a paper with 95 ways that the church had forgotten about the two greatest things about faith. And he, he described this as grace and scripture. These were these two things. And he said, grace alone, scripture alone. These are the, the fundamentals of our faith. Another way of saying that for us, of course, is our Bible, the scripture. Our Bible is fundamentally where we learn about God and the history of the people of God. And then grace is another way of talking about love. And so Martin Luther had said that the church had forgotten these two key things and they need to be the central parts of faith and the things that we need to hold on to as we um, walk with God and with each other in our faith. Our Bible passage today that we're going to be hearing, Jesus tells us um, that there is there are two key things that we need to remember also as people of faith. And he tells us the greatest of the commandments is to love God and to love our neighbor as ourselves. And so I've sort of got a little representation of this and I will be sending this out via email to everybody. Um, these are, this was, quickly drawn in this morning. <laughs> um, but I've got two linked hearts. And inside, I've got inside one, it says God. I think it's probably backwards for you all. And the other one says people. And these are the two most, most important things for us to remember. And Jesus reminds us of that. That the, the greatest commandment that we have is to love God and to love our neighbor as ourselves. And that these two things are linked together. How well we love our neighbors shows how much and how well we also love God. And so these two things are always linked together. 
Um, and Jesus reminds um, the, the Pharisees, the priests that he was talking to at the time, that those are the key things that they needed to remember as well. And so he called for them to love God and to love people. And so he calls for us to do that as well, that these are the greatest commandments that we have, to love God and to love our neighbor. And the best way we can support ourselves or help ourselves to do that is to remember the grace that God has given us, the love that God has given us, and to read our Bibles and to know our history and to know um, and see the stories that God has given to us. And that supports us in li living our life of faith. So remember, the greatest commandment we have to love God and to love our neighbors as ourselves. So let's hear now that Bible passage this morning, which comes to us from the book of Matthew, chapter 22, and it's verses 34 through 46. And this is a continuation of the last couple of weeks that we have been hearing about these dialogues and questions between the leaders of the temple where Jesus was and questioning Jesus and um, his responses to them. And so this is the last of those questions for Jesus today. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to him, you shall love your, God, your Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them this question. What do you think of the Messiah? Whose son is he? They said to him, the son of David. He said to them, how is it then that David by the spirit calls him Lord, saying, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet? If David thus calls him Lord, how can he be his son? No one was able to give him an answer, nor from that day did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. For these words of faith in Jesus the Word, thanks be to God. So on October 31st in 1517, Martin Luther, angry with the Pope Leo X's new round of indulgences to help build St. Peter's Basilica, he nailed a sheet of paper with his 95 theses on the University of Wittenberg's chapel door. Though Luther intended these to be discussion points, the 95 theses laid out a devastating critique of the indulgences, good works which sometimes involved monetary donations, that popes could grant to the people to cancel out penance for sins, as corrupting people's faith. Luther also sent a copy to the Archbishop Albert Albrecht of Mainz, calling on him to end the sale of indulgences. And aided by the new printing press, copies of the 95 Theses spread throughout Germany within two weeks and throughout Europe within two months. The result of Martin Luther's list of items for debate turned out to be a papal bull declaring Martin Luther a heretic. And Luther was brought before an assembly called a diet in Worms in order to be charged. 
We used to think it was a diet of worms, but um, no, it's a diet, an assembly in worms. <laughs> we give the German pronunciation, worms. The main event of the Diet of Worms relating to Luther took place from the 16th to the 18th of April in 1521. On the 17th of April, the Imperial Marshal Ulrich von Pappenheim and the Herald Caspar Sturm came for Luther. Pappenheim reminded Luther that he should speak only in answer to direct questions from the presiding officer, who was Johann von Eck. Eck asked if a collection of books that, that was present before them were Luther's and if he was ready to revoke their heresies. Now Luther, um, in an act to uh, kill some time, requested more time for a proper answer and so he was given until the next day. And on the next day, Luther said that he had prayed for long hours and consulted with friends and mediators and then presented himself before the Diet. When the counselor put the same question to him, were these his books and were, would he be ready to revoke their heresies? Luther, who I think had a little bit of cheek within him, um, first apologized that he lacked the etiquette of the court. But then he answered, the books are all mine, but as for the second question, they are not all of one sort. He had written books on many different topics, um, and so not all of them perhaps would be considered heretical. If I now recant these, then I would be doing nothing but strengthening tyranny, he says. As for attacks on individuals, I apologize for the harsh tone of some of these writings, but did not reject the substance of what he had taught in them. He said if he could be shown by scripture that his writings were in error, Luther um, continued that he would reject them. And he concluded by saying, unless I am convinced by the testimony of the scriptures or by clear reason, for I do not trust either in the Pope or in councils alone, since it is well known that they have often erred and contradicted themselves. I am bound by the scriptures I have quoted, and my conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and will not recant anything, since it is neither safe nor right to go against conscience. And the famously um, um, suspicious or dubious words, um, whether they were actually his or not, um, but the famous words, here I stand, I can do no other. May God help me. Amen. From that stance, Luther was condemned a heretic. But he managed to escape and was hidden at Wartburg Castle. Essentially, though, the whole exercise, the whole thing was a setup to entrap Martin Luther. And that's the same thing that has happened here with our text from Matthew today. And as we have been hearing from the last couple weeks, it was a series of questions with the sole pure purpose of doing one thing, to trap Jesus. On this one, the round three of theological questions, the Pharisees have sent in their big gun, the lawyer, to get to the heart of that matter. And the Pharisees take their best shot at it, but they misfire. And Jesus fires back. And no one bothers to act, ask any more questions after this. The lawyer essentially asks him the question, 
do you have a clue about being Jewish question? And Jesus clearly has a clue about being a Jew. To me, the Pharisees and the Sadducees in this scenario that we have been hearing always come across like the magicians in Pharaoh's court in Exodus, trying to go toe to toe with Moses, but they can't quite squeeze a win out of it. But now we get to focus our text and the last of the tricks up to the local leader's sleeves. In their final quip here, they asked Jesus, which commandment of the law is greatest? And Jesus gives them the most Jewish of all answers with the Shema. And the Shema is the holiest of Jewish prayers that children are taught as soon as they can speak. It's the first thing that they learn how to write. And it's recited each morning and each evening till the day that they die. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love God, love your neighbor. On these two commandments hang everything else that matters in this world, period. I'd like to take a moment here to point out what Jesus doesn't say in response to the Pharisee's question. Remember, at this point in the story, Jesus' crucifixion is just days away, and death is literally breathing down his neck, and he's rapidly running out of opportunities to communicate the heart of his message. But when he is asked what matters most in a life of faith, Jesus doesn't say, believe the right things. He doesn't say, maintain personal and doctrinal purity. He doesn't say, worship like this or attend a church like that. He doesn't even say, read your Bible or pray every day or preach the gospel to every living creature. He says, love. And that's it. All of faith distilled down to its essence so that maybe we'll pause long enough to hear it. Love. Love God and love your neighbor. There are a lot of times in life when a lot of folks will turn this commandment of love into another kind of Pharisaic trick. And I know that in my own experience as a woman, in the church that I've often been given the false choice of living out my faith in the pews, but not in the pulpit. And plenty of folks have tried to convince me that I could love God, but the only ones I can teach about the love of God are children. Theological entrapment. It's been the same and used against people of color, against queer folk, against disabled folk, their faith is used as a weapon against them. And it's shocking how often people want to use God as a weapon of oppression or hurt, trying to entrap people in it rather than letting them be liberated by it, and forgetting or ignoring what Jesus says the greatest commandment is, love. What Jesus was doing here with the Pharisees was radical, and therefore why it was so dangerous. Because at its essence, Jesus was saying to the top clergy of his day in the temple that their whole system of how they lived and worshipped was outdated and aiming for the wrong thing, shall we say. It needed to be reformed, to get back to the heart of God. It, strike me, it strikes me that these questions are not just trick questions, but are trick questions that reveal the heart of faith for the people of Israel in Jesus' time. From the perspective of his enemies, 
Jesus would not be liable for action by the Romans or for rejection by the people over a fruitless question, but over questions in which people have real investment of meaning. That is why these series of three questions had been asked him. Now, the second portion of the text seems a, a little bit more out of place, unusual. What is the relationship between the first half of the text about the greatest command and the second half about the argument that Jesus makes regarding the son of David? Jesus moves directly from the conversation about the greatest commandment to the argument about the superiority of the Messiah to David. And my suspicion is that the question, whose son is the Christ, is a huge matter. If the, Christ, if, is, if the Christ is the son of David to restore the throne of David, or if Christ is greater than David to the point that David calls him my Lord, then the activity of the Christ would be greater than restoring the throne of David. This is perhaps a way of saying that the radical love which fulfills the law and prophets is greater than a restoration of the Davidic throne. That the whole goal of the present priestly caste in the temple was to restore the greatness of David, of Israel in the time of David. But Jesus says it's actually something more than that. So the Pharisees would have seen this as an affront to their understanding of the purpose of the Messiah. And so sadly, they miss the point because of that. Instead of hearing the grace and love of God, they heard an end of all that made them comfortable. And it meant that they would have to stop using God as a way to keep away the people that they didn't like, that they didn't feel comfortable with, people that they felt as unworthy away from God. G.K. Chesterton once joked, Jesus commanded us to love both our neighbors and our enemies because generally they are the same folk. And this is not all that easy. It's not simply a matter of being nice and getting along. It's hard work. It involves getting beyond our likes and dislikes. It involves taking the neighbor seriously as a child of God who deserves our respect and care. It involves continually reforming who we are into the likeness of God. It means no longer using theological entrapment to push people away. You might think, for instance, that people no longer care about having a just relationship with God or any relationship at all for that matter. Humanity has matured and we are now independent thinking people who don't need that kind of crutch. And I think you would be wrong. Faith isn't a crutch. It's essential to human well-being. The congregation asked its worshipers to write their deepest needs on sticky notes and to place them on the walls of the chancel. Words like acceptance, love, forgiveness, and healing appeared over and over again. There was a common theme, lack of self-worth, guilty, inadequacy, failure, and simply not being good enough to deserve love. And, and this is coming from within the church community. We all need love, but what does it mean to do this? How are we to love? And this is where I fear our overuse and our misuse and even abuse of the word love gets us into trouble. We claim to love many things. We love our favorite celebrities and movies and bands and television shows. We love going on holiday or reading a well-crafted novel or watching our favorite football team. We love chocolate or bacon or sushi or chicken tikka masala. And we tend to think of love as a feeling, a spontaneous and free-flowing feeling that arises out of our own enjoyment 
or our own sense of kinship and affinity. We don't think of love as a discipline, as a practice, an exercise, as effort. We fall in love and we sit, insist that love is blind, that it happens at first sight and that it breaks our hearts and that its course never runs smooth. And we talk and think about love as if we have little power or agency in its presence. But this is not how the Bible describes love. Jesus doesn't say, I sure hope love happens to you. He says, love is the greatest and first commandment. Meaning it's not just a matter of personal affinity, feeling, or preference. It's not a matter of lucky accident. It's a matter of obedience to the one we call Lord. Biblical love is vulnerable making, and I'd rather not be vulnerable. Love requires trust, and I'm naturally none trust not no, not very trustful. Love spills over margins and boundaries, and I feel safer and holier, placing up my own borders and walls to protect me. Love takes time, effort, discipline, and transformation. And I'm just too darn busy for all that effort. What would it cost us to take Jesus's version of love seriously? To practice and cultivate a depth of compassion that's gut-punching. To train ourselves into a hunger for justice so fierce and so urgent that we rearrange our lives in order to pursue it. Martin Luther didn't think that the church would change because of his 95 theses. But it did. It rearranged the course of history. Charitable actions are easy. But cultivating our hearts, preparing and pruning our hearts to love, Becoming vulnerable in authentic ways to the world's pain, those things are hard, hard and costly. And yet this is the call, which means that we have a God who first and foremost wants our love, not our fear or not our penitence or our piety. And we have a God who wants every one of God's children to also feel loved by us, not shamed, not punished, not chastised, not judged, but loved. I don't think it's a coincidence or a mistake that Jesus inextricably links love of God with love of neighbor. Each reinforces, reinterprets, and revives the other. As heirs of the incarnation, we cannot love God while we refuse to love what God loves. We cannot love God in a disinfected, disembodied way that doesn't touch the dirt and depth of this world. Our love is meant to reach all those places that no one else wants to touch, reaching into skin and bone and blood and tears. It's meant to tear down walls and beat swords into plowshares. It's meant to look into places we want to hold fast to and reform and reshape them. Neither can we love ourselves or our neighbors in any meaningful, sustainable way if that love is not sourced and replenished in an abiding love for God. Only God's love is inex inexhaustible. If we cut ourselves off from the flow of God's compassion, we will quickly run dry. In other words, the motion of our hearts must be cyclical. Love of God making possible and deepening the love of God of neighbor. The love of neighbor putting on flesh and bones on our love for God. To be reformed and always reforming. So what is it that we are commanded to do? 
I believe the call is to follow in the footsteps of the one who stood in the presence of his accusers and enemies and declared love to be the be all and end all. The call is to weep with those who weep, to laugh with those who laugh, to touch the untouchables, to feed the hungry, to welcome the children, release the captives, forgive the sinners, confront the oppressors, and comfort the oppressed, to wash each other's feet, to hold each other's close, and to tell each other the truth. The call is to that which undergirds all of creation, to remember whose we are and that we were recreated for love. Amen and amen. Friends, let us now move into a time of prayer. Friends, we can come with confidence to the throne of grace, knowing that God hears and accepts our prayers. Let us take time now to pray for the world and its need. On this Reformation Sunday, we thank you, God, for those persons who have poured your spirit into that, then set about reforming your church. We thank you that you are still at work in the life of the church, reforming and reshaping us and remaking us into your image. One of the ways we reflect your image, Lord, is how we care for one another with love, care, and prayer. We pray for those who are in the hospitals today. We pray for those at home with illnesses, pains and recovering from treatments and or surgeries. We pray for those in nursing homes and those who are homebound. We pray for their families during these times. We pray for those who are facing death. And we pray for those who have died and for those who are grieving. We pray for their doctors, nurses, healthcare workers, and, and caretakers. Lord, may we reflect your image in our love, care, and prayer that we put into action for these, your children. We reflect your image in how we love, care, and pray for the world. We pray for those around the world who as Christians face imprisonment and martyrdom. We pray for those countries torn apart by civil war. We pray for those living in poverty we pray for those who live in starvation. We pray for those who are being used in slave labor, child labor, and sex labor. Take us by your hand, God of companionship, when we are paralyzed by our fears and unable to step out in boldness. Give us courage to walk confidently with you. Give your stillness, God of calm, to all who are facing illness, the uncertainty of health. We pray for those in our community who have been diagnosed with COVID-19. May they find healing and comfort. And may they know that their times are, are in your ever healing hands. Write your law of love on our hearts, God of all, that we like our forebears in faith, would be unswerving in our witness to your grace. That is ours through the gift of faith. God of stability and change, we thank you that true reformation is always your work and always being done in us out of your love for your whole creation. We are ever reformed by the work of your love. Amen. So friends, thank you for joining me today. Um, next week, it will be the same time, but a different place. 
so you won't be seeing this behind me anymore <laughs> but it has been a season hasn't it um, a season in which I have seen much good as well as felt a lot of pain for others and so that I hope that w whatever may come next for us that we will face it with the grace and the hope and the surety of love that has been given to us and help us to give it to others. Now for all that God can do within us and for all that God can do without us, thanks be to God. For all in whom Christ lived before us, for all in whom Christ lives beside us, thanks be to God. For all that the Spirit wants to bring us, for where the Spirit wants to send us, thanks be to God. And may the blessing of the God, God the Creator, be upon this place and your place. The blessing of Christ our Redeemer be upon us. The blessing of the Spirit, hallowed and healing, be on our lives. And the blessing of the Triune God be on all who reform and reframe the world for love. Thank you, friends. Go in peace. <laughs>